Yeah, hello and welcome to the third day of the Expanded Animation Symposium. Thank you for coming. I have the pleasure to uh, introduce the next panel to you, the Expanded and Hybrid panel. We have three upcoming talks and I will introduce the first speaker, Frank Gessner. He is professor at the Film University Babelsberg, Konrad Wolf. He is a free artist and professor in Berlin and Babelsberg working. He is also working with the production company, Atelier Berlin Production, on his current project, which he will talk about today. Please introduce and welcome Frank Gessner. Yes, um, good morning with bloody eyes. Last night <laughs> I had a great experience. First I saw Really, it's a great, great Laurie Anderson concert. Afterwards, uh, next to the Sky Chapel, we had also a really great party. And uh, two, uh, um, yes, uh, two women, she, she took me and, uh, and, uh, and showed me the, the Linzer nightlife. It's really great. So, uh, And uh, it's really a good tip for you. There's, there's a, a very good uh, techno club. It's called Solaris. Uh, and it's really like the, it's like the 19th, 90s in Berlin. So, um, and and for this, um, with a little help of my avatar today, uh, I want to, uh, to present you uh, uh, a spherical video essay draft. Um, so, viel Vergnügen. I'm not a filmmaker. For me, film is the extension of language. I begin with poetry, then visual art, and finally cinema which brings together several different elements of art. Which to say, writing, poetry, the object, visual arts, and the image, film. The difficult thing, of course, is the harmony between these elements. Frankly, after Marcel Brudeur's Project Pour Un Film 1948. A small mechanical dummy representing Monsieur Test reads the French news magazine. At times, the camera is immobile, merely recording the side to side movement of the character's head as it supposedly reads. And at others, it follows that movement, thereby offering a rhythmic view of the room occupied by Monsieur Test. This film was processed and edited in Paris under the title Mouvement, which brought us change to Monsieur Test. Sixty seconds left. Another twenty seconds, like calmly take a deep breath. Ten seconds left. Five more seconds. Four, Four more seconds. seconds. Three, Three more seconds. seconds. Two. Two. One. One. Now. Now. Hello. Begin. Starting from Berlin and Babelsberg. The world-famous historical film location of the movies like Metropolis or Women in the Moon and with Potsdam as Creative City of Film recently included in the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. A comprehensive artistic, technological and scientific network of actors is to be established in which the local is on an equal footing with the global. A. Sculpting in time. A space odyssey. From the analog masterclass Globe Playhouse, Corona has grown up the digital project Globe Playhouse Space Lab 
with the idea to make process-related artistic research as well as knowledge available as an open source for everyone on a website of the same name in a curated and designed framework. And in the future, the Globe Playhouse Space Lab will orbit the Test eLab project, which will be realized, hopefully, also on the real surface of the Earth. Test eLab is a bigger designed Globe Playhouse that generates with its guests together something like an expanded animation festival, combining the local, the global and the transcultural media aspects in a worldwide network of actors in a unity of theory and practice. Together we want to build a synthetic generated planetary system. The now initiated Test eLab and Guests project is, is aimed at filmmakers, performers, musicians, dancers, poets, artists, designers, technicians, academics, students, companies and other individuals who are interested in the interface between art, design, science, nature, technology and creativity. Together we fashion the Circus Container Colosseum into a contemporary equivalent of a cathedral or a cross-media riff on the idea of the collective Gesamtkunstwerk. The multi-perspectivity of the test e-lab requires that the actors with their different experiences and competences, artistic languages and nationalities work together in an interdisciplinary way. The Container Colosseum Circus is planned like a memorial temple. On the right, the entrance hall, in the middle, the panoramic center, and on the left, the video lounge. The large 360-degree panorama immerses the viewer in a dark, collective, spacious bathroom. The panorama, a heterotopia par excellence, serves as a stage for testing conceptual intentions and media ideas. The notion of a total panorama to design a shaped world model is a secret utopia. It seems from the universality and flexibility of this medium as a sublime temptation or delusions of grandeur emerge. This expanded animation center generates the interface for a hybrid interactive museum where the user becomes part of the work and who is both a museum and more than a museum, and where the reality replaces representation. Because all the world is a playground, the Shakespearean Teatro Mundi is a narrative for the spherical 360-degree format. But as a sphere, it is also a medial geometric metaphor for a visionary universal space of thought and action that connects us all on the planet Earth as a global community. On the first post-pandemic masterclass of the Film University Babelsberg, Konrad Wolf, people from five continents across all time zones works together in a virtual production space. For this prototypical virtual masterclass, the Agenda 2030 was a guiding theme and we developed a We Are Symposium with international guests. As a guest of honor, we invited an important exponent of deconstructivism, Professor Wolf D. Prix, the co-founder of the avant-garde architecture studio Coop Himmelblau, Coop Himmelbau. At the crossroads of theory and practice, international experts were commissioned to produce 24 video essays. The subsequent one-week We Are Play Jam workshop was supervised by 14 international mentors as well as a technical artistic team. The reference for our We Are Space Lab was a MIR project, which in Russian means peace or world. For years it was the only permanent outpost of humanity in space. As an artist, astro or cosmonaut, I would say, Maybe it wasn't the cosmic city yet, but at least it was a flying house in the orbit. But now, only empty data on the internet. The space odyssey serves here as a metaphor for a better sustainable world without poverty, hunger, repression and racism, as understood by representatives of Afrofuturism, 
like one of our guests, the well-known filmmaker Jean-Pierre Beccolo from Cameroon, who present themselves as offspring of distant planets and as space and time travelers. Because from a bird's eye view, all the beauty of the natural architecture becomes visible, but also the problems of our Earth, our only real house. As a leitmotiv of the Globe Player Space Lab, we think of the collection of the 17 global UN goals, which are to be a blueprint for a better and more sustainable future for all. The masterclass supported pioneering concept art and the development of installation art for hybrid, augmented, mixed, virtual and 360-degree projects in the field of artistic research combining the aesthetic, the formal, the natural and the social design. No games without rules. Starting point of our VR experience as audiovisual base module, the Villa Rotonda. Andrea Palladio designed and built some world-renowned villas in Veneto around the middle of the 16th century. But his fame was also based on the four books of architecture, which were written as a result of his own building activity and his reflection on fundamental architectural issues. Mathematics enables the exact determination of musical intervals. Sounds and the proportions derived from them are attributed a creative musical power to which Palladio refers in his architecture. In addition, he related the harmonious relationships not only to the single room, but also to the interconnections between the rooms in the entire building. Even in ancient times, people argued that music and architecture were relatives. In his lecture, Philosophy of Art, Friedrich Wilhelm Josef Schelling described architecture as frozen music, in opinion that a beautiful building is in fact nothing other than music perceived with the eye, a simultaneous concert of harmonies and harmonic connections conceived not in time but in spatial sequence. Sorry. In his let's, maxims let's and make reflections, a break here. Johann Wolfgang von because, Goethe. Because uh, of my bloody night, I, I took an old video and I want to show you for the last minutes uh, the new one. So I have it and we make a break and we'll continue, okay? Did you find this place? So I think uh, Villa Palladio would be a good uh, turning point. Thank you. The space odyssey serves here as a metaphor for a better sustainable world without poverty, hunger, repression and racism, as understood by representatives of Afrofuturism, like one of our guests, the well-known filmmaker Jean-Pierre Beccolo from Cameroon, who present themselves as offspring of distant planets and as space and time travelers. Because from a bird's eye view, all the beauty of the natural architecture becomes visible, but also the problems of our Earth, our only real house. As a leitmotiv of the Globe Player Space Lab, we think of the collection of the 17 global UN goals, which are to be a blueprint for a better and more sustainable future for all. The masterclass supported pioneering concept art and the development of installation art for hybrid, augmented, mixed, virtual and 360-degree projects in the field of artistic research combining the aesthetic, the formal, the natural and the social design. No games without rules. Starting point of our VR experience as audiovisual base module, the Villa Rotonda. Andrea Palladio designed and built some world-renowned villas in Veneto around the middle of the 16th century. But his fame was also based on the four books of architecture, which were written as a result of his own building activity and his reflections on fundamental architectural issues. Mathematics enables the exact determination of musical intervals. 
Sound and the proportions derived from them are attributed a creative mystical power to which Palladio refers in his architecture. In addition, he related the harmonious relationship not only to the single room, but also to the interconnections between the rooms and the entire building. Even in ancient times, people argued that music and architecture were relatives. In his lecture Philosophy of Art, Friedrich Wilhelm Josef Schelling described architecture as frozen music in the opinion that a beautiful building is in fact nothing other than music perceived with the eye, a simultaneous concert of harmonies and harmonic connections conceived not in time but in spatial sequence. In his Maxims and Reflections, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe called architecture a silent art of sound. Finally, the Globe Playhouse Space Lab exhibitions were opened in the digitally reconstructed Villa Palladio, freely based on Pier Paolo Pasolini's scenario, The Earth Seen from the Moon, and thus recalls on virtual rehearsal stage the planetary perspective of suprematism. In the sense of creative thinking in contrasts, the Villa Rotonda is an aesthetic counter model to the additive and open construction of the MIR flyer. A Mozilla Hubs platform was developed for this purpose, on which users can interact, work and exhibit with each other as avatars in specifically generated 3D environment from a remote location in collective common spaces of a self-designed metaverse. As a first test exhibition for everybody, Frank Gessner designed a moon hotel orbited by the MIR on the Earth Trabant. As avatars, we can also walk inside and see some digital sculpture drafts. In the center of the rotonda, the complete program, missing links from 2015. Counterclockwise in the rooms behind, Selfie as Sputnik Octopus, Selfie as Tiger and Dragon, Selfie as Yes or Nobody, Selfie as Real Case Study. And clockwise around the Rotonda Center, the Mixed Media Sequential Art Project Berlin Open Studio from 2012-13. Our fine arts were developed, their types and uses were established, in times very different from the present, by men whose power of action upon things was insignificant in comparison with ours. But the amazing growth of our techniques, the adaptability and precision they have attained, the ideas and habits they are creating, make it a certainty that profound changes are impending in the ancient craft of the beautiful. In all the arts there is a physical component which can no longer be considered or treated as it used to be, which cannot remain unaffected by our modern knowledge and power. For the last 20 years neither matter nor space nor time has been what it was from time immemorial. We must expect great innovations to transform the entire technique of the arts thereby affecting artistic invention itself and perhaps even bringing about an amazing change in our very notion of art. Paul Valéry, Pieces sur la, La Conquête de l'Ubiquité, Paris. Prefaced by Walter Benjamin. In the essay, The Ideological Antecedents of the Rolls-Royce Radiator, Avin Panofsky presented an early interface between classical art history and film and pointed out the clear structure of the villa of the Palladian style. Nemesin, Nusni, Nusni, Greek, comma pronounced, Nemosin, is the goddess of memory in Greek mythology. The term Nemesin is derived from the same source as the word mnemonic, that being the Greek word MNM, which means remembrance, memory. The basis for all new art that is to come will be the cinema, wrote Jan Göll in 1920. And undeniably, film is a guiding medium of the 20th century, just as the World Wide Web will be for the 21st century. 
Qu'est-ce qu'une Madeleine interactive I dream of a world in which every memory will create its own caption. Chris Marker's storehouse of images produces a new cosmos of over-determined meanings. In this sense, the filmmaker's game with the documentary film genre becomes more of an ironic analysis of the documentary's latent tendencies to monumentalize. Marker's approach is more like a kind of evolution than a lofty subliminity, like folding Japanese origami paper, or new digital photo processes, such as the zapping, windowing, linking, and morphing. Etymology is deceptive in this case, data are never given, they are produced and manipulated. Archiving, like the technology it operates with, is now confronted with processes of fictionalization and transience. It faces structural problems that undermine any overall concept and erode it from the inside. Data, like media, are dying by the year, by the month, by the day. We can already trace a long history of dead media. Method of this work, literary montage. I have nothing to say, only to show. I will not steal anything of value. I will not appropriate any witty formulations. But the rags, the rubbish, I don't want to inventory them but let them come into their own in the only possible way. Use them. Walter Benjamin, Passagenwerk. A spherical hypertext. Книгу написать очень сложно. Я могу только надеяться, что они будут прочитаны по методу взаимной обратимости, по методу сферической формы в ожидании, что мы научимся писать книги. Как вращающиеся шары. Сейчас у нас только книги, как мыльные пузыри, особенно по искусству. Сергей Михайлович Изенштейн. The first Eisenstein's request consists in the fact that the bundle of these essays should by no means be viewed and received one after the other. I wish that they could all be perceived at the same time, because after all they represent a series of sectors which oriented towards different areas, are arranged around a general determining point of view. On the other hand, I wanted to create the possibility in purely spatial terms that each contribution could be directly related to another, that one would merge into the other, that they mutually appeal to one another, one complements the other. Such synchronicity and mutual penetration of the essays could be taken into account in a book in the form of a sphere, where all sectors of the sphere are present at once. And no matter how far they are from one another, a direct transition from one to the other is always possible via the center of the sphere. But alas, books are not written as bullets. We dreamed of a living media network inside out of the web. The symposium Globe Playhouse Space Lab gave rise to the artistic and scientific hypertextual textbook experiment Expanded Animation Worlds, a spherical book in progress, Thousand and One Plateaus. Inspired by Eisenstein's spherical book fragments and the idea of the spherical shape of time, we are currently curating a book of spheres with a round of 2 times 48 equals 96 articles, in eight sequences with 12 articles each. 96 articles are successively expanded and linked to each other, first within the sphere and increasingly into the worldwide actors network. The Artistic Research Interface project is an attempt to link to Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattaris a new way of reading with multiple rhizome-like references. Dancing thought must always go beyond the system and strive to where it cannot be caught. Jean-Luc Nancy 
This paved the way for a theory and practice that can address the relationship between space and freedom in art, science and society. Thinking in cinematic roles, narrating in eight sequences. This model was developed or discovered and theorized by Frank Daniel at the American Film Institute. Two sequences in the first act, four in the second, two again in the third. The sequence consists of preparation, event with crisis, and finally the aftermath. It consists of a three-act structure. First act, 24 articles in two sequences. Second act, 48 articles in four sequences. Third act, 24 articles in two sequences. Today, I would like to briefly introduce the first 48 sequences, which means 24 articles of the first act and the first half of the second act, up to the so-called midpoint. Prolog. An artist's live manifesto. Hello. The Artistic Earth Institute. User manual. Expanded animation worlds. First act. Sequence one. Test lab and guests. Expanded animation worlds. And anima techne, with footnotes, memory spaces. The body as a medium of individual, collective and cultural memory. Back to the future. The power to use an image. Paradise lost and regained. On the virtual archaeology of an ideal garden projection. Between air and ground. Warburg's thought space of sensibility. About Eisenstein's spherical book. Spherical media studies. From the idea to the medium. Essay film, theory, artistic research. Circus Wanski and Perceptions and Effects of Andrei Tarkovsky's Epochal Masterpiece Stalker in East and West Germany. Looking for Diego. Velasquez in Eisenstein. Viva Photo Film. Photo Painting Film. Bubble Vision. Aesthetics of Isolation. And Consume Manifesto. Tableau Vivant. Living images and attitudes in photography, film and video. And painting tutorial. The interest in interest. Making stop motion animation a tool for social engagement. Feeling the film. Haptic vision and the embodiment of images. Hybrid heritage. Don't take Hitler personal. Experimental film society statement. 19 personal thoughts on cinema. Unplugged animation. Kurt Schwitter's Merzbau in Hannover. Human learning X machine learning. The lockdown diaries. Exploring Zoom in a virtual media theater. 24 rooms. A brief story of trial and error. And motion design. Dynamic type. Bridging scene. Second act. Plot point one. Sequence three. Lived space. From Assisi after Padua. Atelier Berlin Manifesto. A prolonged journey. Knausgaard, Munk and Godard. And Beckett, Giacometti and Naumann. Inside a surface. And the multiple life of Fernando Pessoa. And L'objet ambigu in philosophy and art. And Heaven, Hell and the Space Between. Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, and Dante's Divine Comedy, the Werner Nekes Collection, Spatial Extension of Canvas, Screen and Image Objects, Heiner Müller Archive, and Speech on Müller's Death, Media as Sculpture, Aqua Planning, Expanded Illusions, Cinematic Concepts of Immersion, Fictive Philosophy, This War Tears My Head Apart, Circus, Science and Technology, and between popular and experimental theater, on the marionette theater from modern and postmodern point of view, gestalt and anatomy, the artistic path, digital stage, with being with, notes on Jean-Luc Nancy, and excerpt, sexistence, and preface, the agony of Eros, and excerpt, hardcore, and excerpt, Original Kama Sutra, Virtual Reality or the Endo Access to Electronics. And Lyrics, Hotel Morphelia Orchestra, on the composition of imageries, from analog to digital and back again. Namiki shows us Kabuki stage machinery. And Ukiyo E, The Dawn of the Floating World. And Shunga, Erotic Art in Japan, The Art of Anomalies, 
Subversive Examination of Animation Software From the Globe to the Movie Drome Concepts of Vision and Perspective A Nicanism and Musical Theater And Immersive Opera Have a nice VR day Spherical Color Synesthesia Ending Sequence 4 Midpoint Starting Next Level The past, present and future are, as we know, only linked to the process of succession because of their appearance is cosmic time. In our spiritual reality, however, this succession does not exist. Which has a more real reality than the well-known clock, which basically shows nothing other than that there is no present in the strict sense. Time bends into a spherical shape. From this idea, I developed my pluralistic composition technique, which takes into account the complexity of our reality. Bernd Alois Zimmermann, The Craft of the Composer, 1968. What we need today is not the Gesamtkunstwerk next to which life flows separately, but the self-building synthesis of all life moments to the all-encompassing total work, life, that removes any isolation. Lorslo Maholi Nagy A Spherical Hypertext What is Mr. Test? Monsieur Test is an artificial character invented by Paul Valéry who first appeared in his novel Fragment, An Evening with Monsieur Test, published in 1896. This fragment, together with three other fragments, was published in 1926 as an experimental essay-like five-part prose cycle. You will be shown now an excerpt from the artist's video KCEQ Monsieur Test by Paul Yedebeck, Frank Gessner von 2011. Au revoir. Diese Frage ist ganz eigentlich seine Seele. Sie wandelt euch in Monsieur Test, denn er ist nichts anderes als der Dämon der Möglichkeit selbst. Der Gedanke an die Gesamtheit dessen, was er kann, beherrscht ihn. Er beobachtet sich, er manövriert. Er will sich nicht manövrieren lassen. Er kennt nur zwei Werte, zwei Kategorien. Es sind jene des auf seine Akte beschränkten Bewusstseins. Das Mögliche und das Unmögliche. In diesem seltsamen Gehirn, das der Philosophie wenig Kredit einräumt, für das die Sprache immer fort unter Anklage steht, gibt es kaum einen Gedanken, der nicht vom Gefühl begleitet wäre, dass er nur vorläufig sei, besteht kaum etwas anderes als die Erwartung und die Ausführung klar bestimmter Operationen. Sein starkes und kurzes Leben verausgabt sich in der Überwachung des Mechanismus, durch den die Beziehungen zwischen dem Bekannten und dem Unbekannten eingerichtet und geregelt werden. Ja, es wendet seine dunklen und transzendenten Kräfte daran, hartnäckig die Eigenheiten eines isolierten Systems zu erdichten, in dem das Unendliche nicht vorkommt.
When a work of art finds its condition in lies or deception, is it then still a work of art? I do not have the answer. Marcel Brood fears. Thank you very much for your talk. Please come forward for a quick Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. While our next speaker can also set up their setup. So I know it's a little bit hard stuff Sunday morning. Uh, so much sources and references. Uh, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand. And we will get a microphone to you. Otherwise, I would ask you to maybe comment a little bit more in person yes of course as you as you saw it's it's a very complex project i'm working on it since um, let's say the starting point was in the middle of uh, the 90s so it's so I, I i try to find an interface between analog and digital media okay so i'm an artist so i start with drawing painting sculpturing things like this and uh, and around 2000, I started to make this kind of experimental material to find a relationship, a deeper in, a relationship to the digital world. And of course, so let's say with one leg, we are standing in the real world and with our play leg in the digital world. Uh, and of course, I think this is our existence. So, 
and uh, and and this uh, cross media uh, system uh, so it's it's the idea of my work to to combine a lot of different medias uh, a lot of different uh, sometimes very complex theories and to find uh, a translation to the audiovisual so and uh, and this uh, project uh, this spherical book um, and uh, another team is working on the reconstruction of, uh, of Eisenstein's uh, 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 working flat. And this would be an uh, international research station also in the internet. Uh, and and, and I, I, I get this idea because it's really a great idea of, 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 a, of a early hypertextual work. And I, I took this idea and, and tried to find a very specific way to to, uh, to, impl uh, to put a uh, new content inside who is interesting uh, for everybody. And we are working on uh, also for the masterclass uh, with really five continents. Um, and also the book, it's, let's say, it's, it's something like a, a fragmented world in the sense of Walter Benjamin um, to, to find a possibility, uh, a very specific uh, network but in in the worldwide network so it's uh, we try to put it together these ideas and uh, the research of the spherical book uh, uh, I did the last let's say one one and a half year and of course it's complex <laughs> and it becomes bigger it could be too big for one person so um, we will we will create a team and and uh, we will see how we can publish it, because the best form would be the internet. But of course, uh, I, I like very much books. <laughs> I don't know how it could be a book, a, a, a ball, a spherical book, uh, but we try our best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I now want to introduce our next speaker, Franziska Bruckner. She is head of the research group Media Creation at St. Pölten University of Applied Sciences. She is lead of the project's Immersive Media Lab, VR in Motion, Anivision, and Climate Media Frames. And she is also a recurring speaker at the Expanded Animation Symposium, so thank you for coming again. Welcome. Okay, thank you so much for having me again after eight years. So last time it was 2014, many things happened between that. Um, and I'm very happy to present a new research project which started recently and the first outcome of that. Um, well, the framing of this talk will be a famous quote of Norman McLaren. It, uh, says what happens between each frame is much more important than what exists on each frame. Uh, in the realm of animation um, scholarly uh, ship, um, this is something which is like very well known, but I will explain it uh, for you a little bit later for those who don't know the quote. Um, this, will, this was an inspiration and is also the contextualization uh, of this talk. Um, but I will present, as I said before, the project VR in Motion, uh, which is a collaborative art-based research process. And um, we just finished the first part of the project, uh, which is called Experimotion 1. The project We Are in Motion investigates how ca characteristics of analog stop motion animation and data sets of motion capturing can be adapted as expanded animation and cinema concept in the current art discourse. Through experimental combination with virtual reality, the project explores the potential beyond filmic boundaries and creates hybrid artistic tools as well as workflows in the order to artistically discover, advance and build innovative prospects. So what we tried is something, yeah, um, maybe like a little bit like a stupid idea, bring some analog stop motion into VR, which is not, VR is not made for analog stop motion, but we wanted to see what comes out if we combine those techniques in an artistic way. 
Um, the project is an art-based research project at the St. Pölten University of Applied Sciences, where I'm also uh, am, uh, working uh, in, co in collaboration with artist studio Lichterloh. Um, it is funded by the Austrian Science Fund, uh, the art-based research uh, program PEAK. We just started, uh, the project started in yeah, January uh, 2022. Um, in overall, the project exists of um, four experiments called Experimotions. Um, and so what we are doing is we are inviting artists. The first one was Max Hattler, then Friedrich Kirchner is also here, which is very exciting. Uh, Anna Vasov and Paul Wenninger, who are artists in the realm of animation. And um, in some in motion days, which are some workshops, um, those um, artists are invited to collaborate with us and create um, new artistic realms. In the first in motion days or expert motion one, uh, we combined cutout animation um, and VR. Cutout animation is of course very flat, so you have um, a flat surface, you photograph it, and then you bring it into a 3D space, which is very exciting because what do you do with flat images uh, in a 3D space? Um, to get back to Norman McLaren. Um, the whole quote is, animation is not the art of drawings that move, but the art of movements that are drawn. Then what happens between each frame is much more important than what exists on each frames. And animation is therefore the art of manipulating the invisible interstices that lie between the frames. Um, as you can see, Norman McLaren, um, this is two films, um, Pas de Deux from 1968 and Synchromy from 1971, is working with very, very um, different animation techniques. So he was always inventing new things, trying out things. So you, you could say he was also like an art-based researcher in that way. Um, normally, um, it is interpreted like this. McLaren draws movements such that it takes consistency not on the frame itself, but across frames. Thus, movement is felt not in a pose, but in its, it, its experimental taking form across time and space. So not, it's not important what, what is on the frame, but how it develops like the movement, um, the, the drawings uh, over time. The interval is never neutral. It holds in abeyance the traces of movement passing and prepares movement coming. For We Are In Motion, this was like a, a, a really great source for interpretation too. So we didn't take it like literally, we just like, okay, what could the in-between, the in-between of frames be for us? So We Are In Motion um, is interested in those moments between each frame, as the interstices are not only certain time periods between the next recorded frames, but also include transitions between real and virtual spheres that are manifold in different hybrid feedback loops between stop motion and motion capturing in VR. So what we wanted to do is like to create stop motion, bring it into VR, then go back, um, change it, like, like a back and forth between the actual world and the virtual world. Our question was, is how can this in-between be located in the transition from real to virtual space? What forms of interaction will be possible? Um, as I said, it's also like a great source for interpretation. So I asked my colleagues during the In Motion days, um, which took place two months ago in July 22, what the interpretation of the in-between would be. So for example, uh, Christoph Schmidt von Lichterloh, he said, I interpre interpret it as it's not so important what comes out of the process or where you started, but this, this whole in-between process is more important. If I put this quote on the project We Are In Motion, the process is where we develop, set up the programming and keep trying things. We have defined the basic of the idea or the concept, but, but while developing all this software, we came up with many things and went different ways together with Suna and Max, who are our invited artists, which, who gave much input. On, and that's the exciting thing, this actual process. Um, this is also aligned with like art-based research. It's not necessary that there has to be like an outcome an artistic product in this case, um, but the process is like on the key. And then the thing is, how do you document the process? So 
um, the form determines also what, the, what is documented in terms of content. So we tried out many things. We kept logs, we filmed, we did interviews, we did um, recordings and transcribings of discussions because we found out like in, sometimes in these discussions um, some de decisions were made, some, some concepts were discussed which were in hindsight very, um, very interesting. We did some screen grabs and so on. So it's not only documenting what is done is for us in, um, interesting, but uh, also the why a certain decision was made uh, is important for us. Also for art and artistic research, not only the knowledge or one form of knowledge applies, the know-how from different disciplines can lead to innovative findings and inspiring insights. So the expertise from art and science is often inter and transdisciplinary, which only one person uh, really can rarely embody. In particular, the value of collective artistic research lies in the fact that in critical questions, the rules of both the arts and the sciences apply. So this is our team. Um, this is also first glimpse in the in motion days. Um, as you can see, we set up um, in the studio in F. S. Pölten, where the stop motion table was directly next um, to our VR setting, so we could go back and forth and back and forth. Um, Many people participated in the projects. Um, I would just want to highlight Matthias Susinski, for example, um, who is a professor there and kind of um, invented this project together with me. Um, then Studio Lichterloh, which are um, art-based um, or, or, or um, artistic artists, basically, who uh, do their own projects, but uh, also work with other artists. And then uh, our invited artist, Max Hattler, who is a well-known uh, animation make filmmaker, and Sune Peterson. What also was happening is we had some problems of finding the same language as we had the technicians who are really have their own language, and then me as an animation scholar who have some other references and maybe know a little bit more about animation history. Um, then Max, who is an, an artist, but also knows a little bit about animation history or uh, also is in this room. So sometimes it was really uh, difficult to find a common ground. So it was very good to have Sune Peterson with us, who is working with Max um, uh, for a very long time, and who kind of knew the artistic language of Max and also uh, the technical language. So it was like a back and forth of scholar, developer, artist. Um, we met online um, for a couple of times. Um, because Max is based in Hong Kong. And in hindsight, it would have been better to meet in person a little bit sooner, because um, if someone hasn't worked with VR before, it's difficult to, to, um, to envision what like, uh, stop motion would look like in VR. Also, it's important from which point of view is a person speaking, as I said. The aesthetics is practiced, the contextualization is needed. Um, and for me, um, especially the development process is uh, important. What is actually my question? So this in between, this is an ongoing question. So it's, it's not like finally answered, but it will be uh, hopefully in two and a half years. So as I said before, um, I asked my colleagues, uh, what is your interpretation? And Clemens Gürtler from Lichterloh, he said, from a mathematical point of view, it makes sense that they define the opposite to show what I want to say. There is no thin without defining thick at the same time. This translates to the things that I show, the frames, but also defines everything I don't show. So this indirect definition of the space between is precisely these frames for me. What is the space between the frames in our project? I can say yet. So let's look at the frames. Um, Max Hattler did like 10 years ago a work, it's called Shift. And he will show you a short. Okay, there should be some sound. Yes. So it's a very abstract film uh, with abstract sound. 
where we formalistic And we, together with Max, decided, okay, or Max um, offered this to us, okay, this could be like the basis of our stop-motion animation. How do I get back? Um, as you can see, um, this is a making of uh, from uh, the film from 2012. The lighting is um, very specific. So normally you have just have like a lighting from above for cutout animation, uh, which is like a very even lighting. But um, Max decided on this um, very specific lighting where the edges are um, like have like this glowing effect. And this is something we tried to um, include too. So as you can see, um, we uh, built like a small green screen stop motion stand uh, with also the lighting. And we didn't know if it would work. We tried out several um, setups for the stop motion stand, but it turned out it would work very nicely. Um, the history of the objects Max brought uh, is also very interesting. It's borrowed from a collection of Nick Röhricht, who was a design professor at UDK. It's basically Similar objects, but also the same objects he uh, used uh, in, the, in the film 10 years ago. Um, so it was really a nice starting point to translate this film into VR. We also had, I also had a discussion with Max um, um, during the in motion days. Uh, how, what, what about his animation? And he said, the point is that the movement of the single frame is not decisive. When I do sequences, of course, I'm obsessed that it's precise, but ultimately it doesn't matter because it already fits in the movement. This was um, when we were talking about um, McLaren's quote. And I said, but in VR, you don't have single frame anymore. You have a composition of, of many frames. And he said, maybe you'd still have to go back to the single image. In stop motion, for example, I'm messing a little bit up because it fits in the movement. Still, it also gets something like a human element in there because it's not perfect in VR. And in VR, there are all these calculated movements. You have A and B there, and the rest is quasi-calculated. And that's, that is why it's always precise. You could say that stop motion, even there is somehow mangled and maybe come out completely different in the end, this human element of imperfection is still in there. Um, and this imperfection is something uh, we uh, really liked and embraced in this project too. So I show you. Um, some loops, how he did the animation. It's like traditional um, stop motion. We uh, used um, the software Dragon Frame, which is like the industry standard right now. Um, and Max said for the selection like of the object, um, he liked geometrically reduced formal language of squares, spheres, and circles and related forms that come from product design and furniture. So he misuses um, the objects. You can't say what is it for anymore. Uh, what was interesting um, that um, Max was very drawn in his work to the frame. He likes the frame because it gives him stability. Um, <laughs> he, he really had to rethink the frame. So for example, a normal filmic frame would be 16 to 9. And then uh, the second day we said, no, we, we, we need a square because the, it's easier for the computers to process this. So you, you, um, you, you're... Um, yeah, so he had to rethink of that. Um, then what about the frame rate? Normal frame rate of stop motion is 12 frames at least per second. And we really wanted to have like this movement of stop motion. It shouldn't be too smooth. But how to combine it with the frame rate of VR, which is uh, 90 fra uh, uh, frames per second at least. Um, so this is something he was, he was, we were thinking about. Then also the loops got simpler uh, in time. So this is a loop, an early one. You can see um, this is the green screen and this is the keyed version. Um, and you can see this is like a very complex um, sequence. So um, he really transferred in the first days uh, that um, the ideas from the film. And he said, 
uh, in a, a second day. Yesterday, I made somewhat more complicated arrangement in one shot, as I did with shift, for example. But then, after some reflection yesterday evening and in today, the tests with the new material have already become clear that it makes sense to make short little loops from very simple elements. If you have somewhat more complex sequence and you put it in the VR room, then you have at once, and that's OK. But you always have the problem um, that you have the feeling of the frame. If you duplicate it, it looks like a copy. If you duplicate something very simple, it doesn't have such a copy ca character. So you can see this is like a later version. At the end, we also experimented with some, or I also brought in some other materials Max didn't think of because uh, we had enough loops. So also like stones and flowers and wools, like these haptic materials, they are very interesting, although they are photos because they bring a quality into the VR which is not normally seen. Then we have um, also how do we bring sound into the VR. And that's why we in invited Sune Peterson. And what he did, he was working with optical sound. So he has had, had many ideas how to import the sound, but uh, then he, he came up with this optical sound. And he told me, um, I sample the pixels along a line and play that back as a waveform. It means the brightness value. So this is a translating the image into sound by reading that line of pixels and using it as a waveform. If you look at the video, you can see a little ma a line in the middle of the heart. Mm -hmm. And he can modify it. And he said, yeah, well, you could do it automatically, uh, but then the result would not be so good. So we related back, although it could be done automatically, mm -hmm. we related back to some manual input. And he was referring uh, to optical sound, um, which is kind of similar. Um, and this is something also Norman McLaren was experimenting. He wasn't inventing it, but he was experimenting with it. So it is when on celluloid films, um, you have the soundtrack next to the film, and you can also paint on the film and then uh, make a sound of it. Then going to the prototyping, which, is, which was also like an in-between ongoing thing. And Matthias Husinski um, said, what we did is Frankenstein-esque piece of software, because we have Unity, which is kind of the main player system. But we had this, uh, a, as a conveyor belt an animation stream that runs on the crystallized sphere that would come from the different software. I was doing this in VVVV because I could more quickly get to the results that we need. In the end, we needed rap rapid prototyping as an, an approach that can uh, quickly got us to the point. So the team wanted to find out which tools and software were suited uh, best for the use cases. Uh, they were looking into different softwares, uh, Unity, Touch Designer, Unreal Engine, and uh, um, 4V. Um, so they were looking which affordances were needed, which uh, were supported natively, or did we have to buy some as assets for the program, or did we have to program it ourselves? And I think it was like a, like a, a, a uh, oh, yeah, it took some resources, but it was really for us really um, important to find like the, the best tool or the best tools, because this is not only for one um, expert motion, but it will also go on for the next ones. And the th thing is that at the beginning we thought we needed different things than we actually needed at the end, um, but some things were available at the, to know at the uh, uh, right up front, like the networking, the inter activity and the compatibility between uh, the programs. So for example, um, the first prototypes, it is, um, we decided to use Unity and Touch Designer and build two prototypes. And um, the idea was to really um, do the motion animation out from the VR. So we had um, VR headsets with three see-through modes and um, yeah, you could, you could do the, the stop motion directly from the VR. But then later in the process, we decided against this because also the uh, animation artist, Max, did not feel comfortable. And also the quality is not uh, so good. 
Um, we also experimented with uh, two headsets, the Vario XR3, which has hand tracking and is like a very, very good uh, VR headset, um, which also where you can really see the haptic qualities of the, of the stop motion. Um, and then the Oculus Quest, um, which we are referring um, again now because uh, you can bring it with us. So if you're interested in, in the outcomes, uh, I also brought uh, Oculus Quest with me and you can see the results. Yes, um, we use the Mixed Reality Toolkit MRTK for hand tracking um, because for us it was also important that you not only import the stop motion animation, but you can also um, play with it, so it should be playful. And then how do you bring it into the virtual reality? Well, classically in VR, everything is super smooth and of course the motion, just everything is not perfect. But now we have a mixed culture because of our head movements, they're still smooth. But the stop motion videos still have their look. Then the question is how the videos are placed and what else happens to them. So, yes, we were thinking about, okay, there is the 12 frames per second movies, um, we are sequences we import into the VR. And okay, how do, should they move into the, in the VR? Should it also be 12 frames or should it be more? But what we didn't think is, well, the head movements, they, they cannot be done in 12 frames per second because everyone would get sick. So there is always, there's always um, this, um, this difference between, between the stop motion movement and the, and the real movement. And then, like the in-between, um, Matthias was saying, the fact that Max is very abstract in his visual ideas and doesn't make classic stop motion makes the whole thing grateful because we can play with the partial distortion effects where you don't know what the result will be when you turn the gear wheel. On the one hand, we have this abstract level, but on the other hand, we have this very concrete animation clips with, with uh, spatially populate this virtual space. So for him, this in-between is the interplay between abstract and concrete, like the abstract, uh, the abstract stop motion elements, but then also the, the uh, concrete clips. We were talking a lot in our discussions how could we place the stop motion animation, which is like cut out and very flat into the, into the sphere, sphere. So we came up with multi-spheres, spherical multi-planes. Um, we were thinking how, how could this, um, these stop motion animations um, how could we, um, how could we, how could, could these flat animations work in this um, 3D space? And we were thought, thinking of, uh, yeah, well, the, um, the animations have to face um, the view all the time. And then we came out, okay, this, it, this, it doesn't have to be like that. We had, like in the background, we had this animated conveyor belt, which is like, moving um, all these stop motion loops uh, in, 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 wonder, in, in, in many directions and you can distort it. We were thinking about, okay, what is this world we are in now? Is it like satellites going through the center of the VR? Is it, um, or is it like more like um, um, the, the old um, version of, 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 of uh, the, the earth um, thinking like the flat earth and then things are moving around. These were things we were talking about a lot. And then it's also the in between, in between could also be like the flickering images. So um, Suni was talking about the stroboscopic effects um, you have between the frames generated. He said without it, it would be a different experience. So being able to add spaces between images as flicker uh, sounds a li little bit jazz thing they say. For instance, I love working with the video feedback and I also talked to Max how we could do it in this context. We might be able to do it, but circular video feedback will probably be weird. By creating a halfway chaotic system and then having some parameters and the opportunity for it to die out is very interesting. So we created this, this kind of crystal spheres, but they were not spheres, but they should be like, crystals, they, do, they should expand and, and move in the, in the, in the VR space. Um, we had this random UV shifting. And um, as we didn't have the, the stop motion background at the beginning, we were using something uh, Max and Sune were working before, it's called a video performance tool, uh, 
the Hitlerizer. So this is like an early prototype. You can see in the background is like this crystal sphere. Still working with the visuals of the Hitlerizer. In the foreground, you can see our first tryouts uh, with the with the stop motion loops. What we also did at the beginning is um, we did a live keying, but it turned out that it it, it uh, didn't have a good quality, so you could still see the frame. So um, what we did is yeah, we we keyed it by hand and then imported the sequence in, in, into the VR. So this is a second version. You can also see, uh, already see the usability. You, you can, um, if you uh, import the, the stop motion sequences into the VR, you can freely select it by hand and you can place it in the VR sphere. You can duplicate it, you can switch them. You can really place them freely in the in the room, and it also we also um, were very interested because um, then we said, okay, we can also tilt it a little bit, so you can build like three D objects of these flat images, so they don't have to face you all the time. And in the background, um, we dialed down the the um, the crystal sphere a little bit, and this is like just a, a stop motion animation of of wool of a wool coat I did a few years ago. What we were also experimenting is that we prearranged um, in VVVV the stop motion animations. So you had like this setup and then you could uh, go into the VR and then place them freely. So this is how it sounds with sound. This is a version um, Christoph Schmidt from Lichterloh made. He was just working with one loop, but of course you can bring um, different loops in if you want to. And what was interesting, we had some, some visitors also during the in-motion days. And um, in the last day, we also had an animation scholar, Eliska Detzka, from, uh, from Prague, who was in the city. And she really instantly started to play with it. And it was very nice, because it, it, doesn't, if, it doesn't take you uh, long to get into the, 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 the manual, how to, how to use the VR. And then people start playing and building their own worlds uh, with the stop motion elements we, sp we built. Yeah, well, that's how far we came. Um, yeah, so what is the space between the frames in our project? Um, we're not finished, I can't say yet. Um, but yeah, we will find out in the next two and a half years. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, maybe we can move a little bit to the side so the next speaker can set up. Um, now is the chance for you to ask questions about this project. Just raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you. Yeah? Hello, thank you very much for, um, for the talk. Um, and I was wondering to what extent are you interested in moving a historical sense of stop motion innovation that was very much informed by the materiality of the time into a new materiality? Or to what extent are you interested in finding something like a similar process that is born out of a new materiality? Do you understand 
what I'm saying? Like, I feel like Norman McLaren is very much like, you know, it's frame. There's like stop motion animation in the very mechanical structure of the apparatus that he's working with. Um, And now you work with a, let's say, different apparatus in a different world with different Mm -hmm. context. Mm, Are you trying to see what happens if you if you put something from an old older world in there? Or are you interested in applying a similar process of deconstructing the apparatus and seeing mm-hmm. what's what's happening there. I think th- I think right now we're at the stage where we just bring in like the the old elements of stop motion because uh, as as I said before Max was very drawn to the frame uh and for us it was like this is like the starting point. I don't know what what ha- will happen uh like when we work with you. <laughs> I think there will be more much more deconstruction. Um, we are happy with the stage we are right now because we have this interactivity. We are kind of freed from the old frame because you can stage it in the sphere. You, we, we are not done in that sense because there, is a, there are some usability, usability things missing. So you can't group stuff. Um, also, when you import something, the, the, the timing is always the same. So there are some technical issues we, we are working right now. So to get more free in that sense. I mean, the next step will also be to incorporate motion capturing uh, in the system. So then maybe you can also take the stop motion and and, and, and do more like a puppeteering thing in that. Uh, we haven't figured that out. So I, I can't answer it now. Um, I think we're a starting point, but uh, I have the feeling that the further we go along with the project, the more we, de- we, we deconstruct also these mechanics. Another question over there? <clears throat> so you were talking about imperfection mm-hmm. and stop, yeah, which is really beautiful and st- in stop motion and on film, etc. Did did you already get um, reactions of people who are maybe a little bit outside of the project? You know, like who have a, a how this sort of imperfection works in a VR space? Yes. Because I could imagine, you know, I, I know some of the films of Max. They're quite often rather fast and 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 things like this. How long? you think it's possible for for the audience to stay in these sort of rooms? Mm-hmm. I think it depends. I mean, if you look at it as a, like a, um, as, as a VR project where, just you, where you just watch what someone else has arranged, I can say maybe like five minutes, it would be interesting and then, then not. Um, Right now, r- rather family and friends uh, were, were seeing it like this, this um, also version where you could li- really play. But as I said before, we had um, uh, Eliska, uh, Eliska Dietschka here from Prague, who is an animation scholar who is not familiar with v- VR. And she stayed there really for a long time. So it's like first time half an hour and then ah, I want to go back. <laughs> So <laughs> I think what <laughs> what's really cool is like this this playful thing how to you can arrange the stuff and she said she felt really comfortable she's like more drawn to old fashioned animation and she said she said this is the first time in VR I really feel comfortable because of this imperfection and because of this feeling you have of the stop motion and it's, it's a little bit uh, a shame that you that you can't show in the screen grabs like this haptic effect we were really surprised that although these are flat photos of objects, it doesn't re- really feel flat in the VR and you can really see the structure. And this is something I have not seen yet in other VR projects. I mean, there are stop motion projects who are also working with the VR, but this is more like puppets moving and, 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 and stuff. And, and this is like this these ab- abstract forms which still have this haptic effect, this is something which is I have not seen before. And this is something we can build on. Another question? Yeah, uh, we got two questions on our live stream. Mm-hmm. The first one, um, is VR later in the project also meant as the media to watch the animation? Or is it mainly used as a tool to animate? 
No, it's it's meant to be watched in VR. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. And the second question, interface-wise. Yes. Are you thinking about usual u useful contr uh, constraints like an angel splits, grid snaps, or simple math mathematical functions like add, subtract, multiply, or division of space or time? Yes, we are thinking of, of, about it. Um, we. We really <laughs> wanted to do that, but we couldn't do that in time. Um, we we have our Unity experts who will uh, work uh, still on on this on this prototype, and we hope that we can incorporate it. So what we did right now is that we were working in other in other uh, programs and did it outside of the VR because we really also wanted to have those features, uh, but we couldn't do that in time uh, for the last in motion days. Yes. So thank you for all of your questions. Another reminder that you brought the Oculus Quest with you, yes. and uh, later you can also try and have a look yourself. Thank you again for thank your you. talk. I would like to now introduce uh, the last speaker of this expanded and hybrid panel, Eva Fischer. Welcome. Um, Eva Fischer is an independent curator, cultural manager and lecturer in the field of experimental media, audiovisual and immersive art. She is also the artistic director of the Media Art Festival Saiva, contemporary immersive virtual art that she initiated in 2021. She's talking about digital festival making. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to try to set up my slides. Doesn't work. Maybe we try another adapter. Thank you. Does it work? No? Here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, yes, um, I will talk about digital festival making. Um, I've been realizing festivals since 2007. My first festival format was Soundframe, an audiovisual program that existed for 10 years until 2016. After that, I moved to the Diagonale in Graz, uh, where I was head of production and initiated a focus program on virtual and extended reality. I was then also part of the XR Vienna meetup team. And in 2020, in the midst of the first lockdown, together with an amazing team of people, we wrote an application for the new Media Art Festival of Vienna. So what does it mean to create a festival? What is the core of a festival? I guess that all of us have sort of an understanding of what a festival means for us personally, right? Like, of course, during our Electronica Festival. Um, already when we wrote the application in May 2020, our main question was whether you can create that festival feeling online in the virtual space. I believe that a festival in its very core is a place where a lot of energy accumulates. People flock from all possible directions to experience together, to broaden their horizons, to immerse themselves, to network, to let go. 
a festival is a metaphor for our social life, for our good life. It's a microcosm where society is tested and discussed. And we wanted to know um, whether this accumulation of energy, this microcosm, can also evolve in a hybrid or even a virtual setting. Our concept won, <laughs> and we started um, to build Saiva. Saiva stands for Contemporary Immersive Virtual Art and is a real digital experiment. It's a child of the post-digital age. It is physical and virtual, analog and digital at the same time, and it has a physical Viennese fan base on the one hand and a very international virtual community and online audience on the other hand. Its first edition took place for nine days in February 2021 during a lockdown. Under the title Social Distancing, Virtual Bonding, we wanted to explore how current technologies enable us to remain connected to each other on a virtual level in times of physical distancing. Uh, or like even build new international networks and communities. And for this purpose in 2021, we particularly claimed space in the virtual. At the core of the festival were the virtual exhibition and the Mozilla Hub spaces, where we did not only show digital and virtual artworks, but also realized live events, such as live DJ sets that you could watch on our festival stage in Mozilla Hubs, or a collaboration with um, the Austrian radio um, uh, broadcaster FM4, where we did a virtual radio show together, also using Mozilla Hubs and Twitch as our tools. Here you see the virtual space that our colleague Maximilian Prag built for us. My co-curator Martina Menegon and me showed 20 artworks by international artists like the audiovisual artist and AI expert Memo Acton, game and media artist Cassie McQuaita, AI and robot specialist Emanuel Golob, media artist and curator Brooklyn Pacati, the game artist and professor of the new experimental game cultures department at Angewandte, who some of you might uh, have seen yesterday, Margarete Jamann, her colleague media artist Thomas Wagensommerer, or media artist and black trans activist Daniel Brethwood Shirley. And we used Mozilla Hubs as our social web VR tool for social encounters. Martina Menegon and Enrico Zago created several Mozilla Hub spaces for very different purposes. Like ones that had a festival stage where we could broadcast live events via Twitch and you could watch performances together with your friends in the social web VR space. Um, so we spent a lot of time in Mozilla Hubs. Um, for our team communication and for the communication with our audience, we used and we're still using and loving Discord. What do you see here? All of our team communication happens there and we have several channels for different topics and tasks. And we did an experiment in 2021. We wanted to be our Mozilla Hub spaces to be safe spaces. Since we had had some Zoom bombings um, before and did not want any trolls um, to join the festival program. So we created a code of conduct uh, at first place that declared our house rules, um, like not acting ab ableist, sexist or racist, for example. And we made everyone confirm those rules via Discord before they would be allowed to enter our Mozilla Hub spaces. Well, uh, yeah, sounds a bit complicated. <laughs> um, and uh, now, um, from today's point of view, uh, I also have to admit that this was a little bit over the top. Uh, it made a lot of people actually not find uh, the Mozilla Hub spaces. So it was very exclusive, exclusive and mostly people who would understand how Discord works and how Mozilla Hubs um, would be able to use our spaces could actually really get access. So we did not do that any longer after the festival, but uh, it made us think about what it means to host uh, a public online space. For all of our streamings, we used and we still use Twitch. Here you see one of our curators, Tonika Hunter, who presents a full conference program via Twitch. Um, she showed many different formats, uh, like the collaborative uh, music project Geschichten aus dem Wiener with Hartmut and Soja, who you see here, that deals with age. 
um, or the Between Surviving workshop by Moyo and Naoka. And yeah, coming back to Mozilla Hubs, um, together with Christian Davidek, we produced a special audiovisual live edition of his show Davidex and broadcasted the show on several platforms like the FM4 and the Cyber website as a stream, our Twitch account where you could interact also, and all of our Mozilla Hubs festival stages where you could meet with friends and watch the show. Um, Christian invited the singer Lou Azriel and the performance duo Maros Kino to perform live at the studio. And so we had several stages that were streamed from the studio to Twitch and Mozilla Hubs. Here you see our Twitch uh, account where the show was streamed. Our partners Bildwerk had programmed a generative visual live show that was projected uh, in the studio and uh, would show live visuals on the one hand and the Twitch chat in front of Christian on the other hand so that he could also interact with the audience. Um, in the chat, people could use keywords to manipulate the color or the pace of the visuals in the studio or create other effects like a strobo effect. People uh, really had a lot of fun uh, in the chat and also online listening to the show um, was really interesting and fun. So that was a huge success that um, made us realize uh, this show again and again. I also show you some pictures uh, from 2022. Our colleague Angie Paul produced another hybrid radio show together with David Dix and then also Dalia Ahmed's Dalia's Late Night Lemonade. In that joint show, uh, we did a live voguing performance with the Viennese Kiki House of Dive, uh, who you see here in the studio. And we had interviews with Ina Holub and Faris Kuchika Seng, uh, and a live set by Rumi van Bayres, uh, who were also in the, in the festival program. What we also did uh, was invite several artists to create their own spaces uh, with the help of our team, like the violinist and performer Matteo Heitzmann. He created a Mozilla Hub space together with our team, which was based on his live performance, Those We Lost. Um, inspired by the South African photographer Gideon Mendel's photo book, The Ward, um, Matteo Heitzmann in this artwork addresses the survival strategies of the LGBTIQ plus community facing the AIDS crisis in the late in the 1980s and 90s. In this performative solo concert, Matteo Heitzmann wants to pay tribute to the dead. He integrates old video and audio footage from those days into new compositions and creates a contemporary view um, or voice for the struggle for dignity in times of crisis. Um, he also talks about the fact that in times of a global pandemic, stigmatization of groups and ethnicities is a sad truth. One-sided reporting and cheap propaganda are feeding hate, exclusion and biases uh, or biased opinions about so-called others a phenomenon that repeats itself throughout human history. So a very emotional artwork, and I really, really like the way uh, of how it was presented in the Mozilla Hub space. You could walk from one video statement to the other and see parts of uh, Matteo's performance in other videos. And um, yeah, I have to say it really felt like an exhibition. Uh, and at the same time, you got a very nice uh, impression of Matteo's uh, musical live performance. Um, what you see here is a space by Efua Chavis Esando and Wilhelm Scherrübel. It's called React um, and asks the question how I can participate in uh, changing today's society into a less racist or even an anti racist environment. This hub space is an attempt um, to simulate and reconstruct some chosen daily racist um, situations that have been experienced by Efua and others. Um, they are demonstrated on um, several parts in, in the space in a uh, rather abstract way and serve to reenact and to illustrate uh, the situation. So the space is meant as a tool, a tool for visualizing and mostly discussing certain situations. So the visitors of the space become part of an event um, and should be confronted with what happens and how they would feel and react in a very situation. 
Um, for example, here, um, where do I stand? is a staircase. I think uh, some of you might know um, this system. It questions, uh, for example, when the police check me, can I be sure that my skin color is not the reason for it? Or I feel welcome and normal in the usual areas of public life. So it's an instrument to visualize where we stand. And in the Mozilla Hub space, the two artists made visible that Efua, as a black woman in Austria, uh, will stay at the bottom of the stairs since she cannot answer one single question with a yes. And Wilhelm, on the other hand, as a white man in Austria, can go all the way up. So the space is actually still being used, uh, which is quite nice. It's used for workshops that F4 hosts at the Angewandte in Vienna. And uh, also that brought us to the idea to actually uh, collect all of the Mozilla Hub spaces that were created uh, in the course of uh, the two festival editions. And uh, we actually called it our little metaverse uh, already in, in, in 2021. And here you find all the Mozilla Hub spaces that were created. So if you're interested, uh, check it out. Uh, it's, you find it on the SoundFrame website, soundframe.at. And yeah, what was important for us is that it's a, a, a public place uh, where people can really find the spaces, they can use it for their own purposes at any time in any place of the world. So um, yeah, to come back to, to the festival formats, another hybrid format that we realized in 21 was an audiovisual program at the virtual production studio in Vienna that is run by Media Apparat. Uh, we invited three artists, Kike, Craig Ignaz, and Ellie Preis, and um, the live visuals for the show were uh, created by Maximilian Prague. And we filmed three live sessions within the LED environment and streamed the final videos via Twitch then. Um, the visuals by Maxi, Maximilian were uh, generated in real time, partly via the Unreal Engine and partly via Resolume. And another really nice hybrid live format that we had in the festival program was a col collaboration with the Dutch Media Art Festival Impact. Arion is also here. Um, everyone was welcome to join us in Zoom, wear their most crazy digital or real masks and party with us. Using the virtual background options of Zoom, mask, option of snap camera, for example, or whatever else uh, one can think of, people were invited to create the most creative or crazy um, spectacle. The highlight of the ball was the virtual background battle for the best costume and the most exceptional background and masks performance. There was an MC for the whole night and a lot of thought was put into the moderation and dramaturgy of the event. Also, the full show would be followed by a really nice music selection that made everyone dance uh, behind, behind their screens. And I can just say it was really, it was hilarious. It was a very good uh, thing to have. You could definitely see that everyone was having super much fun. And um, that was very special when we think back uh, that this was in one of the first lockdowns. Yeah, and then after all, we needed a break. So we wanted everyone to leave their screens for a bit, get some fresh air and be back IRL in real life. So we had a so-called wellness day. On that day, our full festival website went offline and showed only an art piece instead. Uh, Katrin Spitz, ERA 404, sorry, I'm currently not available, I am dreaming. Um, the artwork was created with the help of an AI. Um, which created calls for action based on the YouTube trend of the self-care routine, uh, where influencers give personal tips on how to experience the lockdown life more consciously and mindfully. Um, so we wanted to talk about self-care and about the need for some AFK, some away from keyboard, uh, keyboard experiences in a time of constant accessibility. Well, nevertheless, we obviously loved to be online. <laughs> and after nine days, uh, we had uh, reached over 7,000 people from 80 countries in the world, which made us really, really happy. Um, yeah, this year, 
in 2022, we were back in the physical space, which was also great. Uh, we did not know until one month before the festival if and how we would be able to realize it. But in the end, we were lucky and could even do events until midnight. <laughs> so under the title Embodied Structures, uh, we talked about the body. During nine days, we showed a hybrid form program of art exhibitions, talks, lectures, workshops, film screenings, and performances at Belvedere 21 in Vienna, the Stadtkino Wien, and the Volkstheater, and online, of course. We looked at the body as a political field between the analog and the digital and discussed which learned and uh, internalized structures we can and must unlearn. We discussed that in a conference and hosted talks and panels like talking about boundaries that you see here that was curated by the fabulous collective D Arts in Vienna. You see Asma Ayat, Person Peri Baumgartinger, Eva Egermann, Sherry Avraham and Jamila Granditz here. Or we had a live lecture performance by Asma Ayat and Ines Mahmoud from Salam Oida in Ich, die intellektuelle Putzfrau, that you could translate with me, the intellectual uh, cleaning lady, the two artists and activists performed a manifesto and spread their message to the nation, as they called it. Again, we streamed everything via our Twitch channel, uh, where people could interact and you could watch the stream on the landing page of our festival website as well. We showed a movie program that was curated by Maria Milovanovic, who is also here, both at the Stadtkino in Vienna and via our Twitch channel as well. Already in our, festival in our first festival edition, this had been a highly successful format and we all uh, felt like watching the movies together. Yeah, and we realized an exhibition at Belvedere 21, and yeah, it was uh, fantastic to be back uh, in the real space or the physical space again. Um, but Martina Menegon, my co-curator, and me uh, also talked a lot about how to include our international audience uh, that we did not want to lose, of course. So we picked several artworks um, that were also existing online like Kaiken's um, Wisdoms for Love 3.0 that you see on that projection here. Kaiken are a collaborative practice co-founded by artists Tanya Cruz, Hannah Omori, and Isabel Ramos in 2015. Wisdoms for Love 3.0 is an online decision-making game in which players can collect non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Uh, it allows you to meet your friends in this virtual land and take on new virtual identities. You will find it uh, online, wisdomforlove.com, I think. Um, players must work um, their way through a labyrinth of metaphorical decisions. The decision-making points are filled with symbolic imagery and sounds. And as the players progress through the game, they collect so-called wisdom tokens, digital artworks of the objects inside the game. Each wisdom token comes with a moral contract, which allows you to freely download the digital artwork, but obliges you to protect it and cherish it, uh, instead of treating it as a mere financial asset. By exploring the game, you start asking yourself what it means to possess something. Online, the game can be played by multiple users. In the exhibition, you could play it as a single player, but the game uh, would start where the player before, um, before you would have left it. So again, it was a collective effort to collect the NFTs. Both online and uh, in the exhibition, you could download the NFTs. Um, in the exhibition, you got a QR code. Uh, to take them with you. And as soon as you downloaded the NFTs, no matter if you had collected only a few or all of them, your history would be deleted and the game would start from the beginning. We showed game-related works, audiovisual generative pieces, sculptures, uh, short movies, such as Made to Measure by Krupp Laukon, that you might know from us Electronica Festival last year. 
for our hybrid festival format. We like the film not only as part of our exhibition, but also uh, because it exists as an interactive online version. Uh, Made to Measure is an experiment that asks you or asks if you can reconstruct the person based solely on their digital data trail. Um, Krupp Lau Kuhn worked together with um, several scientists. Um, studies from renowned universities had shown that over the last few years, a fraction of a person's online data is enough to identify their interests, tendencies, and even intimate personality traits like fears, weaknesses, or addictions, and predict their behavior. Quite often, um, this is explained with the power of algorithms, as Krupp Kuhn says, and they want to show that even without the supposed magical powers of artificial intelligence, we can still create intimate conclusions from the digital trails we all draw on the web. So they wanted to find out whether we could create a digital doppelganger who, in the end, might know even more about the person than the person itself. In the exhibition, we showed a short version as a video loop. In the online version, you can interact and guess along which person could be behind the record. So, yeah, what is um, digital festival making? Uh, we believe that every audience needs uh, something different, and this is an exciting thing for us when it comes to festival making. We want to understand the different needs in a virtual, a physical, or a hybrid setting, and so we tried out many different formats to learn more about communication, about moderation, and presentation. Yeah, we are happy to serve both local, often very private and exclusive sessions, as you see here with Angie Paul and Asma Ayat, who had invited some guests uh, for a discussion. And on the other hand, an international, more anonymous audience. Here you see one of our several experts tours within the Cyber exhibition. Our hosts were Jamila Granditz, who you see here, Laura Welzenbach, who some of you might know from the Ars Electronica team, the Dutch researcher Marijn Brill, and Clementina Milenova, who produced the full tours program. We want to create safe spaces and discuss topics on very personal and intimate levels, connect people with each other and create new collaborations. And we want to reach out to a big audience. We want as many people as possible to see the artworks that we love and we want to share the thoughts of great thinkers and artists. During the past two years, we found out that it is uh, possible for us to create the festival feeling online. Um, VR and social web VR helps a lot when it comes to being in the same space together with others. But having a hybrid form, uh, at least for me, is the best. You can merge the best of two worlds, but it needs a very deep understanding also of what the different tools and levels can help to achieve. So in that sense, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all at the next year's Cyber Festival. It's going to happen in February 23 again. Check out cyber.at. And yeah, thanks for having me again. And I believe that now is time for some questions, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. I would like to... Um, touch upon uh, what you were mentioning about the audience and uh, how different an audience, a uh, physical festival audience is. They come to the festival, they are already on the location and you cannot easily lose them. They will most likely stay there. So I would like to ask you maybe about does the, also the audience have to adapt in a way and uh, yeah, how, how it changes their behavior. Yeah, right. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's a huge difference, I believe. Uh, it's also what you see here again. I, it's so good to be back to such a big festival also like us, Electronica, and um, to just meet people on the streets and um, kind of like, yeah, uh, just go from one to the next and flow around uh, the city. Um, uh, as an online audience, we had the feeling, and we um, 
saw that ourselves uh, when actually also being the audience of our own festival kind of that um, it's very um, hard to build that communicative um, structure so uh, moderation would really be uh, the main thing for us and um, uh, we really tried out many different tools, many different formats. Um, as I said, somewhere then in the end, maybe a bit over the top, um, but that was also a good learning for us, uh, like the Discord channels. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's always... Um, the question if you also overwhelm people, if you use too many different tools. Uh, on the other hand, each tool uh, creates a certain, uh, yeah, can, can, can achieve something, let's say. Um, and uh, also each different tool requires a different kind of skill set, sure. which sometimes people don't even have maybe yet discovered themselves. So very, very challenging. Yeah. For sure. I also wanted to ask about your experience with Twitch or live streaming. Um, also about, uh, especially about watching something together or experiencing together on Twitch. Uh, for example, gaming streams are very uh, popular to experience uh, mm. together. Uh, maybe you can talk about the advantages about mm. that. Yeah, so I would come back to the film program that Maria um, curated. Uh, that was really brilliant. Uh, we had a very good time. Um, that were in 2021, um, two film formats, I think both of them one hour or so. And um, uh, I don't know if you remember how um, the chat worked, but people got really enthusiastic. And I think that what's... Uh, um, different to a cinema situation because in the cinema still you are silent, you are passive kind of, um, you have the huge screen uh, that is made um, for uh, this very purpose um, but then yeah being in the chat with others uh, brought a very different uh, understanding of what it means to, to watch movies together I think so that was fun and yeah. That's so interesting because, of course, uh, in the last two years, many animation festivals had the challenges uh, how to move to the digital space. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, great that there's uh, like positive <laughs> experiences in mm -hmm. that too, watching together. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah. Hi, Eva. Hi. Thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. I was wondering, could you elaborate how you brought the art project into the VR space? So did you give... Uh, the artist space to create it um, themselves so did you help them like it's also like on the technical level not always easy absolutely and uh, again the challenge to have so many different formats uh, and so many different programs um, that uh, yeah have to come to one uh, very platform we did use um, unity to create our virtual exhibition and um, we gave actually everyone the freedom to uh, adapt to it either they could send us sculptures that we would um, bring into the virtual space or they could also you know send us their, their movies kind of and we created some kind of a preview screen where you could then um, go to the very movie on Vimeo or somewhere else so we really wanted it to be as open as possible um, to also host the art it was 20 artworks 20 very different artworks to host the artworks in their very natural habitat as I could say you know so um, yeah not uh, having the need to adapt every single artwork to our platform. Yeah. But yes, Maximilian Prague and Martina Menegon and Enrico Zago helped all the artists and um, some of the spaces were really created together with our team. Another question over there. Yeah, and um, thank you very much for um, the super interesting talk. I was wondering um, if you could elaborate a bit on the fact that you had a very tight-knit Discord community for your first iteration and how that might have been really important to generate a core that was very strong and then yeah. could extend the invitation to the more open forms. Yeah. So this is just like a working theory that we yeah. have mm -hmm. for a lot of um, online theater stuff that we're right. doing. Um, but we've noticed that it was really important to have like a very strong core of people that are coming because you invite them yeah. before you open things up. So if you could elaborate on, on that process of opening up and how 
because you talked about the negative side of yeah. being so close. But yeah, maybe be a, if you could um, yeah, talk more Thank about that. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. You got a very important point, and I totally agree. Uh, and we tried that also. We called it our Cyber Ambassadors Group. So um, there were several communities that we worked together with, like, for example, the arts, as I already said, or um, uh, Frauendomäne or s several others, and we would invite them to build their, um, you know, community space within our space and host it. So there were also programs running on Discord, or um, certain links to, you know, um, parts of the of the Cyber Festival program, and um, so yeah, that was really important for us to have this core and have a program also there. We we thought a lot about how to use the different tools and the different um, programs programs and how we could also show art there, not only use it as community tools, or, but um, yeah, really creating uh, content also on every single platform, on Twitch, on Discord, Instagram, on our website. And that helped um, because, of course, communities bring a lot of people and we could never have done that our own, you know, in the first year of the festival. Yeah, it's great to work together with communities anyways. So. Yeah, thanks for your question. <laughs> Another question? So, as far as I understood, in, in 2021 you used a lot of Mozilla Hubs, in 2022 not so much anymore, right? What is, what is, what is the reason? It, would it have been too much or is it too unstable? Because to my mind it would be, a, it's an interesting tool to, yes, to keep an international audience. Yeah. I uh, totally agree. Um, I, that's why we built the, the SoundFrame Metaverse uh, that I showed you, where all of our Mozilla hubs were still there and we could use them at any time. That was really our thought. We did not create any new spaces because um, it, it's also you know, a pragmatic decision, of course. We only have one festival budget and we, we wanted to be in the physical space. We wanted to be at Belvedere 21 and so we couldn't have afforded to create another virtual exhibition space, but it was important for us to uh, base on uh, what we had created before. Um, no, uh, I, of course, uh, Mozilla Hubs had its pros and cons, um, but in the first year we really loved it. Uh, it was a lot of experiment, of course, uh, going on also for us. Um, and I mean, maybe that's also what you're implying a little bit. Um, <sighs> Mozilla Hubs is is an exclusive tool in the end. You need a proper laptop uh, with a stable internet connection. Uh, you need to, you know, have the skills, have a little bit of literacy um, to actually use it. And yeah, so we also thought a lot about how to be a bit more uh, also yeah inclusive in the second year and have several options for several parts of our audience. The ones that were, you know, that love Mozilla Hubs could go there. The other ones would join us in the physical space. So that was the thought. Thank you. <laughs> Another question in the back? Um, yeah, I think it connects a little bit to what you just said. But um, if you go and organize virtual events, um, how do you make sure that also people that maybe have not so good internet connections, not so good computers, um, can also access? Or how do you balance because you would maybe compromise a lot to do that and then lose on the other end some beautiful aesthetic opportunities that you might have? So could you tell a bit about balancing, balancing these two um, aims maybe? Yeah, that's also a very good point. Thank you. Um, so what we did is, uh, as I already said, we used several platforms to create content and always tried to interlink the platforms. So if we had a, a virtual uh, online event going on, we would always stream it also in Twitch. Uh, and the Twitch stream was not only in Twitch, but also on our website. So you wouldn't even need a Twitch account, but you could just go to cyber.at and see on the landing page what is going on live. So. Um, um, yeah, we we had the feeling that this uh, worked quite well, uh, quite well. Um, 
but yes, I, I think that's really the main uh, main thing to to rely on um, platforms and media that is already used by many people, um, and uh, yeah, just try to give a glimpse of what is happening in the virtual. I mean, another way would be to um, organize ways of interactions that don't require a camera or a microphone even, like mm -hmm. where people could draw together, write mm -hmm. together in spaces, mm -hmm. which I assume lo uh, require lower bandwidth. So, yeah. um, I mean, the options you gave still require a higher bandwidth, and True. not in every country you might have that. But mm -hmm. um, if there's any thoughts that you have on that, um, I would be curious to know. Yeah. Um, let me see. I think, um, yeah, we did not have any, you know, events where people could draw together. Um, um, I guess that maybe you did something like that. Also struggling. <laughs> I, I, Absolutely, no. Um, yeah, as I said, I think, um, yeah, for example, Instagram was really uh, one of the platforms that we used a lot and we still use a lot. And um, uh, we had, um, uh, how was it called? Um, Ayo Alova uh, curated a program for our Instagram feed um, uh, where he would show international pieces and invited artists to create something for the platform. And uh, there was um, discussion going on. Um, so that that is maybe uh, one thing. But uh, in terms of tools, we had many tools in mind. Um, but yeah, so far we didn't use any others. <laughs> but it's a very good point. And um, that's what I like about the hybrid format still, that uh, you know the physical space, obviously, uh, is a very accessible space in the end. Yeah. So thank you for all of your questions. Thank you so much for the talk and Q&A. And we are all looking forward to the different formats of next year's festival. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So we are having a short break and we'll be continuing at 2 p.m.